All right, well, Merry Christmas. Well, hey, if this is your first time here at Eastern Hills, welcome. We're glad to have you uh, celebrating with us as we remember the birth of our Savior Christ. Now, if you are uh, new with us, we do do candlelight service. So at the end of the service tonight, we're going to be doing that. But if you didn't grab a candle on the way in, go ahead and raise your hand at this time. And someone from our guest services team will get that to you. Um, In a moment, we're going to sing some songs together. You're going to hear a message that's helpful and hopeful. There's some video elements. And then tonight we're doing something a little different on Christmas Eve, and we're going to do some parent-child dedications, which we'll explain as we get into the service, and then we'll conclude with the candlelight. But to get our hearts and minds in the right place, because let's be honest, there's a lot of distractions that come with this time of year. I don't know about you, but maybe you've had the sickness bug come through your house, or maybe you've got the sugar bug at your house, and kids are excited about what's coming tomorrow morning, and you're trying to navigate families coming together and traveling. There's all kinds of things that are probably on your mind in this moment. But tonight, we're gathering for the purpose of Jesus. And so to get our hearts and minds in the right place, I'm going to read from you a prophecy. It comes from Isaiah chapter 9. It says this, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Natali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders and the rod of their oppressor. Ever warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Would you stand to your feet and pray with me? Heavenly Father, This service is for you. We pray tonight that you'd be glorified. We pray that you would help us to put aside the distractions that come with this time of year and to help us enjoy your presence, to help us to be focused on the good news of a savior that was born, Emmanuel, God with us, Lord. We pray these things in the power of your son, Christ Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. Christmas church. Want to join us as we celebrate our King?
attention to the score. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not, until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those he favors.
shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. It's interesting that the good news of Jesus' birth first comes to shepherds out in a field. See, there was a couple of kinds of shepherds at this point. There are some nomadic shepherds that live in tents. They're very rarely in town. But then there's also village shepherds who take care of their family's flocks uh, during the day or sometimes run them out at night if it's necessary, graze, and then they come back to town. These are actually the kinds of shepherds that we're talking about in this story. Now, this life is a difficult one to live, that of caring for flocks. Because of the landscape, it's this hill country in Judea. Just outside of Bethlehem, it's all hills with sparse vegetation. And on top of that, it's even on the edge of a wilderness. There's not a lot of food, and so on average, these shepherds would have had to cover five square miles a day just to keep the animals fed. It's this that led to some of this like dirty lifestyle, but they've also got to fight off predators constantly that are trying to just kill their animals. But then on top of that, they step in whatever the animals leave behind. On top of that, the religious leaders of the day actually did not trust them. Uh, they actually viewed them with some level of distrust for whatever reason. We're still not even really sure why. In addition to all of these things, we have this mental picture that we're probably talking about adults, but it looks good, right? These nativities that we get, they always have the adults pictured as shepherds. And that's not to say that that couldn't happen, but most commonly the shepherding role was reserved for the youngest kids in a family. If it's a small flock, the youngest. If it's a medium-sized flock or bigger, it's two or three of the youngest members of the family. And so rather than thinking of adults in this story, we may need to be thinking about kids. But think of it. To the humble, to the lowly, 
to people that are maybe on the first job they've ever had and they're working the night shift and they're young teenagers. This is the news that the angel brings. He says, today, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This is the hope that all of these people had, that they were desperately waiting for for years, that this savior would come, the Messiah would come. But it first appears to these people out in a field, living average, normal, maybe even a little bit rough life. But look at their response. It says this in verse 15 of the story. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. The shepherd's response is to go and see for themselves if this thing is true. What the angel said to them may have sounded wild that all of their hopes and dreams could have been fulfilled in this moment, but they go and look for themselves. See, this invitation for the shepherds is also an invitation for us. In Christmas, we're invited to behold this baby in a manger. We're invited to examine if Jesus could really be this answer to our hopes. We're invited to examine the claims made about Jesus, and we're invited to examine what the Bible says about him to see if it's true for ourselves. What do you think of Jesus? C.S. Lewis famously said he's either liar, lunatic, or Lord. Maybe he's a liar and he went out of his way to deceive people and just confuse the world. Maybe he's a crazy guy, he's a lunatic that went out of hand, truly believed the stuff he said, but it's not true and then everyone else took it too far. Or maybe he is actually who he said he was and he is the Lord. But which of these best describes where you are at with Jesus right now? Do you feel like maybe we've been sold a false bill of goods and it's not that great? Do you feel like maybe uh, when we're on this hook for, for crazy and there's no good explanation for it? Or maybe, just maybe, he is actually Lord. Jesus once said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. There's a lot of children in the room tonight, and I love that as the next generation. In fact, all of the kids here tonight, would you just do this for me? On the count of three, I want you to yell out, Merry Christmas, as loud as you possibly can. Three, two, one. Yes! Faith, declaration, excitement, joy. That's why we gather each Christmas, to remember the arrival of our Savior. When Jesus said these words, he wasn't saying to believe without good reason. That would be unreasonable. Jesus wouldn't be supportive of you ignoring the questions that you have. That's not faith. That's fair, fear. Jesus wouldn't be one to suggest that we should ignore evidence. In fact, he would say that that's foolish. In fact, when Jesus said this, he was saying that we should come to him much like a child. You know a question my kiddos often like to ask? It's just one word. It's three letters. Why? And it's a powerful question. Why for thousands of years would people gather to remember this moment? What does it mean for you and what does it mean for me that we have a savior that has come to earth? What does it mean that he is Emmanuel, the presence of God, come to dwell amongst us? You see, on the day that Jesus was born, the angel said, do not be afraid for behold. This is a word that's used over 1,500 times in the Bible. 
And it doesn't mean to just contemplate or speculate. This word means to fully immerse yourself in whatever comes next, to give all of yourself in consideration. Well, what follows this word behold is this, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. But what does that mean for you personally? How do you approach the claim of Christmas? Is he your savior? Or is this just another story amongst stories? Is this just a tradition amongst traditions? Maybe you're the type of person that would say, I don't care about the facts, I won't believe. You came tonight and said, there's nothing that that guy on the stage could say to change my mind about who Jesus is. This is just another holiday. I recently watched a film and it's a story of a couple that retires and this man, he's a mathematician and he's lost his purpose. He's, he's trying to figure out what does he do with his life and somehow he finds that there's a loophole in the lottery system, that there's this game that based on basic math, he's discovered that he can make a lot of money and that he can't lose. But what's amazing is he goes to friends and he goes to family and he keeps saying, it's simple math. It's simple math. You just gotta have faith. You can't lose. You need to buy into this. And people that are closest to him, his own kiddos look at him and say, you're crazy. I want nothing to do with this. $27 million later, boy, boy, were they wrong. And yet I share this because I wonder sometimes if we show up to church and we read the Bible and we read the scriptures and here's God saying, here are the facts. This is a God that loves you. This is a God that has given you purpose and meaning that there's nothing in your background or past that scares him away from you experiencing a living God. And yet you say, I don't know if I can buy in. I don't know if the math adds up. Or maybe you're the type of person that says, I care about the facts, but I'm hesitant to believe. Because maybe for you at some point in your life, someone hurt you, someone wronged you. And your thought is, if God does exist, and this God is love, and this God is light, and this God is peace, why would he have allowed those things to happen to me? or someone that I love and care about. I'm just not sure if I can follow that Jesus. Or maybe you're the type of person that would say, I do care about the facts and I will humbly submit to the truth wherever it leads me. See, the claim of Christmas is that this child became a man. And the claim of Christmas is that this man ultimately goes to a cross where he gives up his own life taking on the sin of humanity, doing what we could not do, so that all those that would turn and trust in him would be given new life, eternal life. And these claims are not just validated by professional Christians or pastors. These claims are validated through historians. People that weren't even followers of Jesus document the resurrection of Jesus, documenting that over 500 people saw Christ in resurrected form. But here's what I would like you to do. I want you to move from the first Christmas as we remember Christ in the manger. And I want you to fast forward with me to the first Easter. On the cross, Jesus is gathered with people that he had done life with. You're probably familiar with Mary and Mary's sister. But also at the cross, was John, one of the disciples that had a close relationship with Jesus. And could you imagine Mary in this moment? Some of you are mothers. Some of you are grandmothers. Can you imagine what it would have been like for her to look upon the cross and to see her son beaten, tortured, and left for death? And in this moment, Jesus turns to John, and he says, behold, contemplate, don't miss this. Behold, looking at Mary, behold your mother. And then he turns to John, looking at John, saying to Mary, behold your son. And it's not that they had a relationship in the sense that they were mother and son, 
What Jesus was helping them understand that in this moment, through his death, people would be brought together, not through bloodline, but in Christ. That everyone that would turn and place their faith in Jesus would be united into the family of God. You see, at some point you have to make a choice. At some point you have to make a declaration. Do I believe that Jesus was who he said he was? Even Thomas in all of his doubt and all of the evidence, Jesus said, go ahead, physically touch me. And at that point, he still had to take a step of faith and trust. And so tonight, what we're gonna do is we're gonna respond by inviting a couple of families to do exactly that, to demonstrate their faith in the claim of Christmas, that a savior was born. So would you welcome these families up here to the stage? We have Chad Shepherds and Abby Shepherds and Junia and Phoebe, and we have Katie and Brian Carr with Hunter and Kinsley. And we have Bill and Ann, Annie Perry and Belle and Barbara and Adam Campbell, who's up here with, or they're making their way. He's coming. Such is parenting. So the question is, why do we do this? We do this because as a church, we believe that every human life has value and purpose and that nobody here was created by accident and that every person here in this room and every person here on the stage is created and designed for the living God. And so years ago, this act was demonstrated for us through the Gospel of Luke. It says, when the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. But we believe that you can't lead someone somewhere that you're not willing to go yourself. And so this is less about the children just as much as it is about the parents and their faith saying, to the best of our ability, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're committed to raising our children to follow after Jesus, to put into practice the words of Deuteronomy. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts and press them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. But the Apostle Paul said that when you do this, you shouldn't exasperate your children that to follow after Jesus, it's not a have to, but that it's a get to. And that ultimately we want our kiddos to say that this is joy filled. This is something that I enjoy doing. But we also do this publicly because we believe ultimately that we're better together. That the words of Hebrews says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting, together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you day, see the day approaching. So church, our commitment is to do that, is to come alongside these families to encourage them and to support them. So I have a few questions. Do you understand that your children are a gift and a trust from God? And is it your intent to provide a home that is characterized by love, authenticity and commitment to God's purposes? And is it your intent to be an example to your children of what it means to be a follower of Christ? Church, would you stand this evening as we pray for these families? I'm going to invite you to extend your hand as if your hand was on their shoulders praying for them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have heard the heart of each of these parents, and now we ask that you help them fulfill their role as loving parents. Please grant them the grace needed for them to grow in their own walk with you, and then guide them and give them the wisdom needed to parent well. 
Lord, we know that there will be unexpected challenges along the way. And during these times, please remind them that their children are a gift and a trust from you. Please give them the wisdom necessary to guide their children toward you. And most of all, give them the joy of seeing their children grow up to love you and serve your purposes. We dedicate these children to you. Bless them, care for them, protect them for your goodness and for your love. You have entrusted these parents. May you be praised, praised Father. Amen. Let's celebrate this evening this step of faith. So how about you? How have you taken a step of faith in your own savior? Maybe it's a situation that you're going through at home or in the workplace. Maybe it's big questions that you're wrestling with. Every single one of us have that moment where there's a gap, where we have to fill in that gap with faith and confidence that that child became a man and that he went to a cross and he took on the debt that you and I could not take on ourselves. He was put to death and he was risen. And if you believe that to be true, then these words that we're about to sing really ultimately is the best news. And so this Christmas, if you have a faith in Christ, if you have a relationship with Jesus, would you declare that to be true? Would you sing not just words, but hope? as if there was a world out there lost in darkness that needs to know the light that is Jesus. Let's sing together.
John's gospel, we have the why of Christmas. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In this final moment, I would encourage you to resist the temptation to make this just another ritual. In this moment, what is the darkness in your life? I wanna invite you to give that over to God. The things that you don't wanna talk about around Christmas dinner, the things that you're ashamed of, the embarrassments, the guilt, give that to him because there's no amount of darkness in your life that this light isn't powerful enough to overcome. Let's remember that now.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for being the one who didn't create us and abandon us, that despite our rebellion, you pursued us. Thank you for being love. Thank you for being the light in our life. Thank you for being mercy and grace. Thank you for being an example. Thank you for loving us enough to die for us. Thank you for being our friend. Thank you for showing up in the hardest moments of life. Thank you for the promise that we're never alone and that you are always with us. Father, we worship you as redeemer. We worship you as healer. We worship you as savior. We worship you as king. Father, we lift up those here in this room that are hurting. We lift up those relationships that need reconciliation. We lift up those that are here tonight thinking that their life is meaningless. Would you overwhelm them with your presence? Would you speak to them in truth? Would they find their hope in you and you alone? For you are a God of miracles. You are a God of that does the imaginable, the unthinkable. And so we ask that you would show up in our lives and give us the courage and strength to take this light into a world of darkness and to proclaim the good news of our Savior. It's in his name that we pray, amen. Well, Merry Christmas one more time. 
I hope you have an awesome, awesome Christmas celebration. And I pray that you get an opportunity at some point in the next few days to talk about the hope that you have in Jesus. Merry Christmas. Go in peace.